Okay, uh, so yeah, as you said, my name is Grant Shanklin, and my talk today is entitled Trouble with the Troubleshooter, a primer on CVE 2022-301 ID. So again, as I mentioned before, I am a senior at Olathe Northwest High School, and I've been fortunate enough to get into cybersecurity at a pretty early age, um, getting experience through the Threat Ops R&D team at Huntress, as well as the penetration testing with the OSCP certification. So, Without further ado, kind of what, what we're going to go over today in this presentation is start off with what even is a zero day, anyone who might, not, might, uh, might be a non-technical person or um, newer to the industry, and then to go over how reverse engineering a CVE might look like, we're going to use a specific zero day, and um, again from Microsoft Word, and we're extracted, reverse engineer it, and then maybe even have time for a quick demo and see, let's see that in action. The goal for this talk, I want everyone to make sure of a solid ground or background on what a zero day and CVEs are, um, and then get understand the technical details of CVE 2022-30090. I also think it's, it's really interesting how it's not too complicated, um, but still is you know, very impactful zero day. And um, so the third, and then understand how to uncover these details for yourself. Um, I hope that by the end of this, the next time a zero day kind of hits the scene, you want to go and reverse engineer it for yourself. So, uh, yeah. What even is a zero day? So according to the Oxford um, Dictionary, the zero day is deriving from or relating to a previously unknown vulnerability and to, to attack some piece of software. Um, in a simple term, again, this is a new vulnerability. Uh, there's no patches out for it. There's no mitigation techniques. It's brand new. And we as a security industry need to figure out what, what, what are we going to do um, how are we going to stop this attack from kind of propagating throughout the internet? So, I, I would bargain many of you already know what a zero day is, um, but if you've never used that term before, um, to make that connection, it's easier to look at a couple of examples of zero days. Um, the first one, a security researcher, research, researcher discovering a bug in Java logging library which abuses, and abuses it to gain remote code execution. Obviously, this was the infamous um, log for shell attack. You know, it's a very uh, prominent zero day. Another one was when the, uh, the zero day being used is when the United States and Israeli cyber groups utilize approximately seven zero days um, infecting programmable logic controller software, uh, which created a deadly cyber weapon dubbed Stuxnet. So hopefully those two to show you like, the implication, like these zero days are very important for the security community, again, to get under control. So the first step in that is reverse engineering them. So that's kind of the front lines of this, um, this section of cyber. So CVEs, the last, more, last kind of piece of background information, a CVE is common vulnerabilities and exposures. And basically, this is just a reference model that creates common nomenclature so we all know what vulnerability and what zero day we're talking about. There are many different uh, zero days out there that get named by every, almost nearly every security vendor something different. And the CVE number is just to identify that we, we all know what we're talking about. It's the same vulnerability as um, yeah, what we're talking about. So, yeah, let's get on to kind of the technical details. Where did this vulnerability, um, it's going to be interchangeably called Felina um, and CVD 2022-30190. But Felina is a little bit less of a mouthful, so we'll probably use that for now on. So, um, Felina first hit the scene in May of this year when a, NAT, a security research team named NASA posted a Twitter uh, post that mentioned an interesting maldoc submitted from Belarus to Virus Total, and there's some screenshot that looks interesting. Um, it, again, I it mentioned it's a maldoc, which is a malicious document. In this case, it's a malicious Word document, but that doesn't look like a Word doc in the screenshot. That looks a lot closer to some JavaScript, potentially, or something of that nature. So that's something we'll have to kind of see if we can get to that point. Um, and see if we can, yeah, see, see that from starting at the Word doc and get to the point where we can see the actual exploit. That's kind of our first step. So if you've never looked inside of a, or looked at the details of a Word doc before, it's, it's one file like, uh, under like the dot doc extension, right? But it's almost like, think of it kind of like as a zip or a, an archive. It's, all comp it's multiple files compressed into one. Um, and so much so that you can think about it this way that the unzipped utility in Linux works with it. You can most unzip the doc, doc file, extracting all the XML um, files within it. And 
With that, there's a file called Word slash underscore rels document.xml.rels, and this is a metadata file that contains outside references, which seems pretty interesting. And that could be the culprit of where this, where how this zero day is being exploited. Um, so I think that's a good place to start looking in that file. Um, opening it up within VS Code, we see there are many different references within this. There are a lot of links to schemas.openxmlformats.org. Um, and then one that stands out that's highlighted is to xmlformats.com. This is, sounds kind of similar. It might blend in if you're just scrolling through a file, right? But um, it actually is untrusted and could contain something malicious. It's an HTML file, um, unlike the other ones. So that also catches my eye at the very beginning. So that's kind of where this investigation takes. The next turn is we need to figure out what's in this HTML file. Because this HTML file is being loaded in as an outside reference and um, being read when the Word doc is open. So let's take a look inside this HTML file now. And opening it up, you see a lot of comments. That's, that's interesting. They're JavaScript comments because this is within a script block, and, but it's still within an HTML file. Um, so this is really interesting. You know, Generally, an attacker would want to compress a payload or make it like a lot smaller. Um, why is there a lot of comments? That's interesting. Well, we'll come back to that for sure. But scrolling all the way down, we can see that after nearly 60 lines, there is a um, payload um, that looks that is what we saw on the Twitter post. So we've got to the point where the security research team posted about. Um, we know how this how this code is getting onto your box, it's you know, kind of coming through the Word document. Um, but now we need to know what does it actually do, though. Uh, but before we get into that, if you're playing along at home, next time one of these um, zero days um, hit the scene and you want to go for yourself, three websites that I highly recommend you get, um, that you can start reversing from is A, Virus Total. I know many of you probably used that or heard this before, but um, if you have it, it allows um, anyone on the internet to go to submit files that are suspect and might be malicious to be ran through various antivirus products. Think of like Microsoft Defender, maybe Kaspersky or McAfee. There's nearly a hundred um, antivirus products, but from the security research side, security researchers are able to download files that have been uploaded to analyze them further, which is how this um, zero day was first detected. Second one is any.run, which is a cloud platform in which you're able to run, again, suspect files, and um, it basically provides a platform for the whole security community to see what happens when this file runs, like what processes get spawned, or is there network requests that happen, and um, is there system files that get modified, and uh, that's where I started with this, is I found the any.run instance for this specific zero day, and we're able to go from there and kind of start reverse engineering locally. Um, the third one, Malware Bazaar by Abuse.ch, a little bit lesser known, um, but I still highly recommend. It's basically a collection of a lot of malware. So, you know, we're, we're, as long as we're doing this in a safe environment and you kind of know what's going on, um, you can use this website to get samples um, from a trusted source. Um, even though you know they're malicious, but you can um, know what you're downloading at least. Um, so, Let's get on to actually reversing like, what's going on. We, we see the payload, but what does the payload actually do? The first thing that catches my eye when I look at this large payload is I see A, a base64 string. Base64 is a long string of alphanumeric characters, a lot of times padded with one or two equal signs at the end. Um, but if you haven't used it before, it's basically a, um, an encoding scheme which takes plain text and turns it into a string that's easy to transmit and is like a safe in PowerShell or any other language. So, if you have, for example, if you have special characters within the plain text, Base64 can like normalize that and make it um, so it's able to execute, basically. Um, so that's interesting. We see almost like a directory traversal at the very bottom, where there's that continuous string of dot dot slash, you know, dot dot slash, dot dot slash. Um, which is almost like a web vulnerability typically, but this is not a, obviously not a, I mean it uses JavaScript, but it doesn't seem like this is a web exploit. So that's something interesting we might want to take a look at. Um, also, and then the last thing is this is all within a window.location.href, which is a link in JavaScript, right? Like this is not, you know, some PowerShell variable or something. This is a JavaScript link. And you expect links to start off with HTTP colon slash, 
but this uses ms hyphen msdt colon slash. So that could be give us another hint of what's actually going on here, which we'll need to research a little bit further. But I like to first split up the payload, um, add some enters, add some tabs. As this will not run when it adds has um, all these you know extra spaces and padding within it, but it makes it easier to read. At this point, my goal is like. I want to be able to read, be able to read through the payload and see what's going on. So if it's one long string that's like 17 lines long, that's not very easy for me to read, right? Um, we want to break it up, make it a little bit um, simpler, and then also resolve encoding. Obviously, these with either for obfuscation purposes or just again to make characters so it doesn't like error out, like make characters like safe. Um, encode them, for example, in PowerShell. We use square bracket char and then code. Um, and at least me personally, I don't know what char 58 is, so I have to go through, you know, look those up and then transfer in the specific uh, character that that represents to, again, make it more human readable to us in our reversing process. The next thing, again, base64 is a two way function. It doesn't just go from plain text to a seemingly random string, it goes back to the plain text. And now, we're, now this is getting closer. That, that looks a lot like PowerShell. We can see uh, this PowerShell is doing things and um, is executing code. And that's the end, the end goal of a lot of these zero days is to get remote code execution, which we can see at this point, the exploit, um, however it works, is getting to remote code execution, which is important to take note of. So let's review kind of real quick, um, how do we get to this point? The victim first downloads a malicious, the malicious word file, which contains an outside reference to an untrusted URL hosting an HTML file. This HTML file contains a large block of comments, um, but further down there's some JavaScript, which sets the window.location, which is, which is generally where you put like a link, uh, to some MS, MSDT schema URL, again leading to remote code execution. Uh, I think the easiest point at this point is, let's start breaking up some of these pieces that we still don't understand. Uh, the first thing is the massive comment block, like why is that there? Um, and this is where there's so much great information and collaboration in the InfoSec community already. And there's a great researcher, uh, Bill um, Deemer Copy, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. But he's actually a fantastic uh, Microsoft System Internals expert and has some great resources with actually like him decompiling parts of like Windows and Word and um, a lot of really interesting things. And he found in a previous reversing project that there's actually a hard coded value within Word that if the HTML file is not 4,096 bytes, it won't even get read. It just, it just gets thrown out. So if those comments aren't there, that those seemingly like unused, just like comment block, the exploit actually breaks immediately. So it's really interesting. It could be used maybe in detection in the future, or um, it could help us, you know, when reversing um, any zero day, and any time a zero day pops up again. So that's why the comment block's there, which is kind of funny, that generally, generally don't have hard-coded byte limits, and, um, but apparently we do here, and it's just kind of an Easter egg hidden within this. Um, this the next thing is, uh, I think the secret behind this exploit is going to lie in, what's this schema URL? What's this um, ms hyphen msdt? And a quick Google search leading you to Microsoft Docs shows you that these are Microsoft URI schemas, which allow you to open apps by clicking on hyperlinks. Um, that's exactly what we, we're seeing here. Is it's, it's not hyperlinking to a different website, but hyperlinking rather to open up an app. Uh, that definitely seems like what, what, what this could be using. Um, some examples that you might be more familiar with is like colon, or mail to, or ms call, or ms chat. Um, you might know those, but ms msdt is opening up whatever msdt is, which would logically lead us to our next Google search which um, leads us to the Microsoft Support Diagnostic Tool, um, where this presentation gets its name from, the troubleshooter. This is the function whenever you, you know, I'm having issues or issues with my Windows PC, you click, you know, troubleshoot, it goes through a slider bar and like returns nothing almost like 99% of the time. But um, there are more things going on under the hood um, than you might think. And we see the syntax from the Microsoft Docs with this command, and that looks exactly like our payload. So this URL is able to pass parameters such as ID and slash param to um, open up the uh, MSDT executable and begin executing code. 
because uh, Azira is actually in, in the Microsoft support diagnostic tool because we're able to abuse the parameter function and run our arbitrary PowerShell. So you can see that here, again, there's the msdt.exe being launched. We see our ID, skip, and then the parameter, which contains uh, specific kind of, uh, like, I guess, sub-parameters, like you call them, and uh, which then contain our PowerShell. And uh, obviously, this should not be able to be launched from within the Word doc and, uh, and then lead to invoke expression and our PowerShell. So we can't uh, just stop there. We definitely, you know, we should see this in action. Uh, full transparency on this part. This is not my video. This was sourced from John Hammond's YouTube or Twitter channel, rather. But uh, there's a payload which uh, this payload that uh, is base 64 encoded just opened up a dialog box to kind of prove that our code is being executed. The base 64 is added to the payload that we've been looking at this whole presentation, uh, served up via Docker. And then when the Word doc is open, lo and behold, we'll see the troubleshooter pop up, and now our code has been executed. There is that um, payload that we um, specified. So in conclusion, back to the goals from today, is getting a background on zero days and CVEs. Hopefully by now everyone knows why CVEs are really important, and, we should, um, and why zero days are important, and you know, next time one you know, comes up, we'll want to take a look at it. Um, second, getting a background on the technical details. There's a lot of like interesting nuggets in this exploit, in my opinion, and also it's not super complicated. Like, hopefully, you know, most of us were able to follow along, and kind of see how it worked. And again, it wasn't like some crazy like you know digging into like assembly code, you know, like looking for buffer overflows. It's like it's just exploiting a feature within Windows that was unknown, and um, I think that's really interesting. And then the third is to uncover these for yourself. Like, hopefully, after this presentation, the next time you see a zero day up on Twitter, you want to just go download it from Dyer's Total and start, you know, poking at it yourself and um, trying to see where you can get. Uh, additional resources. If you want to look further into this specific zero day, uh, these are some great resources. Also, use many of these for the presentation. We can leave that up if we need to. But yeah, I think this at this point I'm built for questions. If there's time or I can stick around afterwards and get everything answered. So, thank you.